Welcome back to Tying That Guy. I'm Wes Chatham, and this is my good pal, Ty Frank. How you doing today, Wes? I'm doing all right. How are you doing? I'm all right. What are we going to talk about today? Uh, season 2, Episode 8, Pyre, which was written by a friend of the show, Robin Veith. Everybody will remember her as the best, best guest we've ever had. Will there also be a guest today, guys? Um, yes, but we're getting to that. Clint. We'll get to that Clint. Guys, Jesus yeah, Christ. He's, he's, come, he's yeah, become yeah. drunk with power. Like like <laughs> one fan said they liked when Clint showed up in the comments, and now he thinks he fucking runs the show. So, Ever since fan that favorite. fan said they like it where Clint <laughs> <laughs> Clint is now popular. Of course we got a guess, and we're going to announce the yeah, guest. But first, but, I'm saying this episode was written by Robin Veith and directed by Ken Fink, and later we're going to have a guest on the show. Our good friend. Which is also our crew shout out. Our, our, who will also be our crew shout out. Lindsay Walker, Texas Ranger. <laughs> <laughs> so we start this episode, uh, A Belt of Refugee Ship, and we get to meet Prax, my best friend in the whole world. And uh, it's played by Terry Chen, who is uh, a good friend, a good pal, and is a phenomenal actor. And he did such a great job with this role. You know, I think Terry Chen is the emotional center of this episode. And one of the things that you guys do well with The Expanse is it's this interplanetary conflict. You display what happens on multiple levels. You have the the planetary level, then you get down to the governmental level, the corporation level, but then you when you you get all the way down to somebody like Prax, which brings it to the human level. And and that opening scene when he realizes that he loses mate and Jesus Christ is Prax having a bad day today or what he wakes up in the refugee ship every the place that he grew up everything that he's known his whole life is now destroyed he lost his little girl and then the one thing in his life Doris and and I was going to ask you what is his relationship like with Doris before this the idea is that they were just coworkers uh huh. But, you know, be, you know, sometimes you have coworkers where like you haven't spent a lot of time in the corporate world, Wes, but I have. Right. And you'll have coworkers where, you, where you're where like you banging the broom closet every now and then. No, no. What I was going to uh, say is you'll have oh, coworkers sorry. where you're like, I find that person very interesting. If we didn't work together, I might ask them out or if I wasn't married or if they weren't married. Well, you know, there's always people around you like that, that you have that thing. And in this situation, you've got you've got them, these two people who maybe had a little bit of a mutual attraction or whatever, but they had always been professional. Now, suddenly their whole world is shattered. They're thrown into this highly emotional situation. And she's saying, you know, let's just stick together. We're already friends. Let's just stick together. Let's see where we end up. And obviously he's into that idea. You know, he, he's, he's going to go along with it. And Doris is the one ray of hope in yeah. this poor man's life of everything that's happened to him so he stands up on his own two feet he follows her he's going to go to mars with her and he's gonna he's gonna survive she goes into the airlock the belter stops him and they space her well first i guess we could we should draw attention to how it was done like how it was created the it was really well shot really well told really well done it all slowed down yeah the the cutting back and forth between him and her the evolution of seeing her and and there's a little bit of hope in his eyes and they smile and there's a connection and there might even be a romance in the future. Yeah. Uh, and then the slow horror of realizing that she is being spaced and that the ship is open and it was be it's beautiful floating in this angelic music. And then they send her out into space where she dies without any air in her lungs. Yep. Yeah. It's pretty horrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and so one of the things that we like to do on the show and, and in the books, too, this is a recurring theme in The Expanse, is that there's no good guy and there's no bad guy. You know, early on, we sort of empathize with the Belters because they seem like they're very put upon. They're very, uh, you know, they're very oppressed by the inner planets. And so there's like a natural sense of like, we should sympathize with these people. And then they're, to a large degree, they should be sympathetic. But at the same time, that doesn't make them the good guys. That doesn't mean they're righteous and they're angry too. So you get, you get these angry belters who one of their stations was just destroyed because of this inner planets war. They've got a century of oppression. They're taking it out on people. They take all the inner planets people, they put them in the airlock and they blow them out the airlock. 
and it is it's a horrifying act of murder and revenge and it's committed by the people that a lot of people think they're supposed to be sympathetic to again we look at history a lot and you look at history and there are so many examples of oppressed people when they are given power, turn right around and become the oppressor. You look at like Rwanda, the one group of people had been mercilessly oppressed by another group of people in Rwanda for, for decades. The minute that that oppressed group, uh, you know, the minute that the, the group that had been oppressing them was no longer in power, the other group went and got machetes and killed a million of them. Just hacked them apart with machetes because of the oppression they'd committed. Mm -hmm. It's a repeated theme throughout history that uh, the oppressed people can become the oppressor just like that. Yeah. You know, it kind of reminds me of uh, Breck Eisner, one of our directors, his, his father's Michael Eisner. And he told me a story one time or a lesson that his father told him that really resonated with me. He said to Breck, he says, whenever you're making a deal, whenever you're operating, uh, and this is on a business level of kind of what we're discussing, but if you're getting in a business agreement or you're making a deal with somebody, you never use your power or your leverage to get the better end of the deal. It's got to be winning on both sides. It's got to be rewarding on both sides. Even if yeah. you're able to get that temporary gain, because ultimately what happens is you cause resentment and yep. it's going to have an impact. It's going to affect you. It might not be today. It might not be tomorrow, but it's going to accumulate and it's going to affect you. And it's definitely on that level. If, if you're going to try to take all of the cream of this, of these people's resources and use your leverage and power over them, eventually they're not going to put up with it anymore. And they're going yep. to, this is cutting ahead, but they're literally willing to just lob 30 missiles at earth. And yeah. hope that one gets in and they don't yep. care about the countermeasures. They don't even care about what's going to come back on them. It's a repeated thing that that somebody who has had no hope in their life. This is how you make terrorists. This is how you if you have a factory for creating terrorists, this is how you do it. You take people, you tell them that they have no hope, that there's no future for them, that they are not part of the larger story. And you give them no way out of that. Some percentage of those people will do anything they can just to hurt you. Like, they don't even have to gain from it. They don't even have to get anything. Like, ju they just want you to feel the pain that they feel, ir irrespective of what the, the consequences for that will be. And it, it's a repeated story. It happens over and over and over again. And we never seem to, humans never seem to learn our lessons. If we're creating this, this oppressed minority and we're just shitting on them all the time, at some point, some of them are going to do something to hurt us just so that we feel the way that they feel. Yeah. It's always tragic because it's tragic that we oppress the people and it's tragic that they felt like their only way out of that oppression was to commit some horrible act of murder. Yeah. It's more complicated than learning your lesson because there's the intellectual mind and there's the emotional mind. And if somebody yeah. wrongs you, then you're like, fuck you. And it's even if you know, I intellectually, I know this is wrong. This is not going to be good yeah. for me, but I'm going to hurt them like they hurt me. And then, uh, you know, add the, the complexity of, uh, whoever's controlling the message or whoever's controlling the narrative or what is being put out there, you might be believing in some lie or something that is pissing you off, which is not maybe necessarily the truth. And you might have a different understanding of that situation if you knew the full truth, you know, particularly in the, uh, in the Belter world, you know, the, are they getting the truth? Are they getting, you know, the right information? Are they being manipulated? Yeah. So we're on uh Tyco station. And Fred chokes the shit out of Diogo, <laughs> trying, to, <laughs> trying to figure out where Anderson Dawes went. And, you know, the more I go back and watch this series, the more I learn about Fred Johnson and the more I like Fred Johnson. And I think that when Dawes sends Fred Johnson that message, and it's kind of really talking about what you and I are talking about right now, of saying to Fred, I think you have the best intentions for the Belters, but you're an earther. And it's in your DNA yep. and you really don't understand what we mean when we say equality and what we mean when we want to be sitting at the table. And, you know, one of the things I learned about this because Drummer has that conversation with Naomi about Dawes mentoring Fred Johnson and bringing Fred Johnson into the OPA world in the Belter world. Could you expand a little bit more about their relationship? Because I didn't know, I thought that was really interesting. I always wondered how Fred Johnson got involved with the Belters and, and Tyco Station. Well, yeah, I, we, we talked about this actually last time that, that we wrote a, a short story called The Butcher of Anderson yeah. Station. And it is about Fred, the act that drove him out of the military, that drove him away from... I know about that. And we, we talked about it and, I, and, I, and the incident 
that call that he got the name of the butcher. But what? How did he hook up with Anderson Dawes and they start? Well, that's in that that's uh-huh. in that story. Um, so what's in the story is Fred basically becomes suicidal and he's hanging out in Belter bars on series. Oh, this. Oh, yeah, you did. Talk and, about, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and he's picking yeah. fights. And he's, I don't think he would consciously say that this is what he's thinking about doing, but he's acting in a self-destructive right. manner. And he gets confronted by Dawes. Dawes has him black bagged. They have him put in an airlock. And Dawes says, if you just want to be dead, I can take care right. of that for you. Like we, this, this conversation can end with you going out that airlock if that's right. all you want for yourself. If you actually want to make up for the thing that you did, if you actually want to make the world a better place for the people that you hurt, I can show you how to do that. And that's the beginning of their relationship that Dawes takes Fred under his wing and begins to show him what he can do to make the belt a better place and to help the people that are there. And some decade later, you know, we find Fred, he's, he's running Tycho station working to help the belt, but that was the so beginning of So if you go back to uh, the seventh man last episode and he nominates Anderson Dawes to be the speaker uh, for the belters, he's le- that's a legitimate, yeah. uh, I was thinking that was probably political manipulation or whatever, but like now in retrospect, knowing the relationship, that was like a legitimate thing, right? I think it's both things. I think you're right. I think it's both things. I think, yes, it's political. Because Fred knows that the Belters will never rally yeah. behind him as their leader. But I think he also knows that Dawes is the guy who's been working to better the life for Belters for decades now. And probably would be a yeah. good negotiator for them. So I, I think I think You know, and going back, Fred Johnson, you know, is the one character that hasn't really lied. I thought you yeah. think he's lying. The whole time, but you go back and you look yep. and he's, he's a one guy that's really been up front and honest and values his relationships and honors his word in a lot of things. Well, if you, if you want to know who Fred Johnson is, we tell you who he is. In the episode where uh, Avasarala goes to the bar and meets mm-hmm. up with Souther and they have their conversation, and Souther tells who, because Souther knew Fred, you know, when Souther was uh, in the Navy and Fred was in the, the Marines, they knew each other. And Souther talks about Fred. He says, he's an honorable man. He's a guy who, who left this business and hung on to his soul. And that's a hard thing to do. He's telling the truth. Now, the, the machinations of, of all the stuff that's going on make it seem like Fred's got all these like other motives. But in reality, Souther right. was telling the truth there. Fred is an honorable man. He's a guy who hung on to his soul in a dirty business. And he goes through the whole, you know, we have him in five seasons of the show, and he is the guy who is consistently honorable and truthful yeah. for five seasons. Do you think when you're done with Hollywood, you're, you're going to hold on to your soul? No. I don't have it now. No, I, I, I sold my soul ages ago. I, I have no regret over that. No, and, and let me tell you, if you have the opportunity to sell your soul, do it. Because the devil, he, he keeps his word. Absolutely. He gives you everything you want. I've got everything um, I want. So, uh... Naomi and Drummer are investigating the antenna where Cortazar last shout out, and they're trying to figure out where the shout out came from. Is Naomi, is there a little bit of her wondering? Is like, oh shit, is this, my, is this the protomolecule I hid and is it coming out? Yeah. Yeah. No, 100%. We are deliberately uh-huh. doing that as a mislead. We are deliberately having it seem like they're going to figure out where Naomi's thing is, and Naomi's worried that it's, that's the thing that's, that's doing the shout. So that she almost feels relief when they discover it on Ganymede. If we back up a little bit, when yeah. Naomi first learns that the protomolecule is still out there, that she, I mean, obviously she knows, but that Holden and Fred are aware, she gets a little saucy with Holden about not telling her that protomolecule is out there. And it's like, uh, hold on, Naomi. You hid the protomolecule and you haven't told anybody in your crew. Because when she says, how come I didn't know about this? And he said, we didn't have any time. And then I was like, okay, cool. She moved on from it. She get, But the next scene... He comes up to talk to her, and she's throwing shade. And I was like, whoa, Naomi, now come on now. This is the pot and the kettle. Uh, <laughs> yeah. that, that's a interesting. <laughs> Here's the thing is, in my experience, people get the, the most angry at other people for yeah. the shit they know they're doing themselves. Like, like if, you, right. if you've been lying to somebody, 
and then you discover that they've lied to you, you always right. go way bigger on their lie. And I don't know why that is. I don't know why humans are like that. But yeah. when somebody loses their shit over something that seems minor, I'm always yeah. like, I wonder if they're up to that. Because it, it's like when somebody has a really jealous boyfriend, like, ah, like, I wonder why he's so jealous. huh? <laughs> you know, where does that come from? Yep. But that's actually true. Like the most jealous people are also right. the ones that seem like they right. cheat the most. So they they find the uh, the that the shout outs coming from Ganymede and hold Naomi do some detective work and they Cortazar connects them to Protogen Protogen connects them to Doctor Strickland and Doctor Strickland connects them to yep. Prax. Yep. <laughs> okay, now Prax is having a bad day. We just established that, and on top of that, he's got a a cut the size of Florida on the side of his head. <laughs> And then Holden comes and yokes him <laughs> from behind with his hand over his mouth and throws poor Prax in behind the crates and starts questioning. And I know Holden had to take a little bit of caution because he didn't know exactly how Prax was involved with it yet. But come on, Holden. Jesus Christ. Like, you know? Well, I mean, from their perspective, the thing that he's got in that little silver container could be a sample of protomology. True. You don't you don't want to give him a chance to yeah. crack that thing open and infect everybody in that dock. Is that in that uh, is that a symbol of the fragility of life? It's his work. It's the genetically modified soy plant that Prax and Doris and the other scientists in that dome were developing, and it's the last sample now. So he doesn't want to lose his work. So it is the thing that he's spent years ways. working yeah. on. Okay, so now the Belters are inspired by the uh, the speech from Anderson Dawes. And, you know, we talked a little bit about this earlier, but they're like, you know what? Fuck these guys. Fuck Fred Johnson. Fuck Earth. We're going to go in there. We're going to take those 30 missiles, yep. the UN missiles, and we're going to throw them at Earth. And they might shoot down all of them, but one yep. might get through. And when that one get through, it's going to cause a little bit of pain, a little bit of destruction. And maybe they can taste just a little of what we've been through. And they, they yep. go to the bridge. They storm the bridge. Yep. They take everybody hostage. They shoot Drummer. This yep. is not in the books, right? Drummer, because Drummer getting shot at this point is not in the books, correct? Because this is... No, 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 no. No, m most, of, most of the events of this uh, are not in the, in the books. Because I don't remember if I read this in uh, the script for the first time, or, or obviously when I read it for the script, but then when I saw it for the first time, because I'd grown to love Drummer so much as a character, because before in the in season one and two, Kara, she didn't work the full time. She would come in and she would do her parts and leave. And I'd got, and you get to know her a little bit, but it wasn't like you, we know her like we know her now. But I just remember thinking, wow, she is a fantastic actress. Yep. It's a, she this is a great character. Like this is such an asset for the show. And I remember when she get, gets shot in the belly, I was a bit horrified that, oh no, are we going to lose you know, drummer. Yep. Are you kidding me? You think no. drummer can be killed but by she one bullet? Flips no. And turns it no. into one of my favorite moments in the whole series. And she blasts those guys in the yep. face. And how did we get away with that? Because we were at sci fi yep. at this time. Like, you weren't allowed to shoot people in the face. Like, what? Did, how did we sneak that one past? We were after prime time. And okay. you can get away with All a right. lot more because if you're it not need, in the they prime need time. to be shot in the face. And yeah. that's. They, <laughs> oh, they, they, they one had of the most to go, satisfying and moments just took care of that. <laughs> in the whole in, in the whole show because they shot her in the stomach. You think she's going out, but hell no, she's not going out. She walks on her own strength and blasts them right in the fucking face. Yep. And part of what happens because of that is Drummer seems like a legitimate right. threat from then on in the show. That when Drummer's pissed. Everybody reacts like, oh, yeah. this is bad that she's pissed because she, she's dangerous. The audience believes that. The audience like, she is fucking dangerous. <laughs> we just watched her shoot two guys in the face, you know? Like, like if she's angry and she's looking for violence, she's a person it, it, who is, a, is dangerous. And not only shooting two people in the face, took a bullet in the stomach and took it in stride and walked her own, yep. on her own strength out of there. Yeah, she, she's awesome. Yep. But but don't skip over your part because this this also has one of my favorite uh, second season Amos sequences where they send him out to the outside of the spinning ring of the station, you know, cut the air supply to that room and he's walking on something that's trying to throw him away. So he's got like the mag boots on max strength. So he's not getting thrown off the station and he's got to like walk forward really slow, hanging on arms flying up in the air because the station's kind of taught trying to toss him off. I love that whole sequence where he, he cuts open the, you know, Amos cuts open the metal to get into it. Right. 
and the sparks are flying up rather than falling down. And then once yeah. the metal piece is done, it just like whips off. It gets thrown off. All that stuff is great. Um, it really shows you like how gravity and direction are so arbitrary in space. You know, like it doesn't, you know, the, the thing is spinning. So that means gravity is away. And, you know, you're trying to walk around on the outside the whole time you're out there. That thing's trying to toss you into space. When he cuts the thing off and it sucks out of there and it flies away, it really sells like, oh, shit, how much pressure trying yep. to walk to get to the oxygen. All those years of dance that really paid yep. off right there for me. And <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's beautifully um, done. Your choreography uh, oh, is yeah, amazing. So uh, speaking of Amos, so Amos has been, you know, spiraling out of control ever since he was triggered by that little boy. And, uh, and obviously it tapped into something deep and he was even contemplating maybe getting the, you know, doing a, a brain operation to wipe out his ability to feel anything. And that's how intense, uh, it was for him, but he ends up doing, you know, going to his old two, where you just go in a bender for three or four days and it picks up and yep. we see Amos walking. He's been in a few fights. He's got, obviously he hasn't slept. He stinks. He's sweaty. He's wearing somebody else's jacket. That's never addressed. <laughs> <laughs> which by the yeah. way shout out to Wes here that was his idea and I, I love I uh, everybody loves that idea that like <laughs> uh, Amos just shows up he's got somebody he's else's also, coat on and he's <laughs> uh it'd be fun to get to our eight listeners to come up with what happened the night before what was the sequence of events that led to that morning of Amos and we'll call it the rough it was, night it was a and rough whoever, night like, it was a whoever rough can night. write out like the best you know sequences <laughs> or our favorite we'll send them a, a signed book or something or whatever they want or or oh you're you're giving my yeah. books away oh yeah though, that's my you? favorite thing to do <laughs> we'll give, I'm gonna give you a a, a, a a signed book and maybe a signed one of Ty's underwear signed underwear and uh, and you can frame it. But, well, my wife does buy me very nice underwear. Tommy so. Johns. That's a, that's actually a good Tommy gift. Tommy Johns. Uh, I don't remember, but they're nice. Let's I like let's them. see them. She, she buys them. I wear them. Let's see them. Nice. The fans want to see what they're going to win. Let's see them. Yeah, <laughs> I I'm, I'm not going to drop trout <laughs> in front of the camera here. <laughs> um, but yeah, so let's try this. I think it'd be fun. It, whoever comes up with what we like the best of the of what Amos did the night before. He's wearing somebody else's jacket. He hasn't slept. He's been drinking a lot. He's been in a few fights. And then whoever wins, we're going to send you. Is it Okay, but here's, here's the thing, Wes. I can't read fan fiction. There's a variety of legal reasons I can't do that. So you will have to be the judge. Right. Well, whatever. If somebody actually does this, you will have to be the judge because I can't Or if you list, let's just have it be a list, not like a story, just like a okay. list. Like went to this bar, went to this brothel, got in this fight, stole this guy's jacket, robbed this guy, <laughs> you know, did this, you know, had a, all, all of those things. So because well, list, list doesn't qualify as fan fiction, does it? I don't know. I, I'm just, I'm really okay. careful about it. But, but you know, what we could do though is you and Clint and Joseph could read them all and be the judges okay. of it that that that's yeah that's not and the winner idea. gets his an unlimited supply of of uh the expanse books <laughs> uh, unlimited, <laughs> unlimited supply yeah. like, no i'm kidding the winner would get a signed copy of the expanse what should we should, should it be the book with this is in like the book that this this season's about or should it be or just a, the whole book series rather than books i think you should give them a thousand dollars <laughs> no, I think the books are, are more, I think the books like sign, I think that'd be a spot or, or a po how about they can choose? You can get a book or you can get a poster or you can get Ty's underwear that he's wearing right now. The sexy ones that his wife bought for him. Those are the three. <laughs> and then, you know, Amos has that moment where he's, it's the first time that we see Lydia's name or any mention of Lydia. Uh, yeah. And he's looking, he's obviously keeping up with her. And the thing, and, and, you know, that really tips off that, that Lydia is some, somebody that's important to him. And so Alex is pissed yep. off because he thinks that a Amos is just running around drinking, having a good time, and he's not helping with this relief effort. And yep. so Alex, you know, tries to motivate him to get him to help out and, and not just, like, spend his time drinking and partying. So they ended up getting in a, a Amos and Soltz's family. You know, when Amos gets pushed, he goes straight to his family yep. and that really fires Alex up and they get into like a little scuffle. Alex is particularly yep. good in this scene because his reaction to Amos yep. really makes the scene work because it goes from, you know, I knew something was off, but something is really off. Like, I don't even know. Like, uh, I'm looking into the abyss yep. when I look into your eyes, you know. 
Uh, and he did a really good job, and that really made that scene work. Uh, yeah, and uh, and um, we've talked about this before, but writing scripts is always a group effort. You know, Th- there's a person who who whose name is on it, and and they did you know the lion's share of the work. But everybody always pitches in, and one of the things that I do on the show is I generally do, a, especially in the early seasons, I would do an Amos pass on every script, and I would just tweak the Amos scenes and tweak the Amos dialogue while people were still getting used to writing for him. This episode has one of my favorite Amos lines that I've ever written, which is the one where he goes. You and I can't fight, Alex, because if we do, who's going to fly the ship? <laughs> and it's just, it's the matter of fact that, like, Alex, if you force me to fight with you, you're going to end up dead. And, like, there's no question about it. He's not like, you know, like, maybe you'll win, maybe I'll win. It's like, we, we'll get in a fight. You'll be dead. I don't know how to fly the ship. <laughs> I loved that line, and I loved it when I read it because you have to truly understand Amos because if you, that line could have yep. went bad, you know, if you've done it with, in, with bravado or if you've done it, but if you're literally trying to explain to somebody like, no, 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 we can't, we can't fight. Yeah. Who's going to fly the ship? You know? So it's like, it's not, it's not a threat. Nope. He's not bragging. Yeah. It's yep. not bragging. It's not a threat, it, you know? And to, you know, that really is little hooks like that. Give people a look into the psychology of Amos, where what happened was, Ty, if you remember that as we got deeper and deeper into Amos and his past and his psychology, more and more people watched the show and writers were watching the show. Everybody started to get on the same page or the same board with yeah. Amos. And that, and, and that was really interesting. Yeah. And that was fun. I, I, as, as the seasons went on, I had to do a lot less rewriting of Amos stuff. Then I had to, in the first two seasons, I, I rewrote a lot of Amos stuff. But from about the third season on, the writers were really getting it, especially Narain had really dialed in to what we were doing with Amos. And, and so when he was doing his showrunner pass on scripts, was really good about getting the Amos stuff down to, to that sort of minimalist version we always try to do with right. him. Yeah, so, but it was only in the first season or two that, that there was a lot of rewriting that needed yeah, to happen. Yeah, one of the things that I did that I looked at before every, almost before every big scene is I would read the turn of the beginning season, but I would write everything that anybody said about him. And then also what the author said about him. And then I would write out what he said, uh, what, what the yeah. words that came out of his mouth and what he said. And I, I wrote it all like that. So if you just see how people are describing him, what people, cause people are always trying to figure him out. The original Amos Burton who was sitting yeah. around from who's, Obviously, really smart, very clever, trying to gauge what he is and read who this guy is. He picked up really quick, you know, the psychology. And so every time I would read that, I get it. And it started to, it gives me a center. You know, it gives me a a foundation to start working off of because it's so easy to slip into ego or bravado or, or any of those things. And, 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 uh, that's not as interesting. So, uh, we're going to invite our special guest on and our crew shout out. Lindsay Walker. Uh, well, she's Lindsay Walker, Texas Ranger. Sorry. I'm sorry, Ty. Because, because we had like 17 Lindsays on the show. Uh-huh. So we had Lindsay Walker, Texas State Ranger. Then we had Lindsay King George. <laughs> Those are the only two Lindsays I actually cared about. So there were other Lindsays, but I, I, don't, I didn't give them nicknames. Well, that's, you just hurt all the other Lindsays' feelings. <laughs> they're, they're gonna... <laughs> yeah, but I don't care about that. So, <laughs> okay. You know. I would always do the Mad Max, you know, Walker... The the uh, Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, Captain Walker. Yep. I, I, I yep. she was Captain Walker for me. So All right. I had my special. You know name. what? That's totally valid. Yeah. Captain Walker's good. I think- there yeah, there she is. is. I've never been good with timing and cues. <laughs> so this is Lindsay Walker, Texas Hello. Ranger. Lindsay, tell us how you are and then tell us what you did on this um, show. I'm good. Toronto is slightly opening up. And you didn't get COVID and die. I did not get COVID and die. That's good. Yep, mostly because we've been in lockdown forever. So what I did on the show is I, like, there's it's about 18 different titles for what I do, but generally it's either set supervisor or key costumer, which basically means, in a nutshell, I am responsible for making sure that costumes look exactly the way they are supposed to look before they roll. So you had to dress Wes every day. Yeah, and in some cases I had to help him get undressed. (laughs) Um, so, okay. so, you yeah. you just you just made a whole lot of people listening to this jealous. <laughs> There's a whole lot of people who now think you're a, just a badass because uh, you got to do this. If, if by a whole lot you mean like three or four, no, yeah. no, I mean well, like five, of the eight, five out of the eight people who listen to this. Oh, okay, are super <laughs> excited. It's one of those job titles that's 
or jobs descriptions that's always sort of evolving. So it can be the, the generality is is track costume continuity and make sure that it looks the way it's supposed to before the camera rolls. Make sure that they have their coat if they're cold or take their coat off if they're yeah. too hot. If they're wearing ridiculously high heeled shoes, which fortunately on the show is not usually a thing, provide slips Amos to make does. sure that you got their slippers. Yes, Amos does. <laughs> But that's always off screen. I'm with sound when we put the microphones into the costumes because spot the mic wear was always my favorite, least favorite game. It's making sure that everything that is covered should be covered and sometimes being the cast advocate in the room. So yeah, it's, it's a, you know, cover them in dirt, take dirt off, cover them in blood, clean up food stains if they spill. That's part of the reason why I wanted to get you to come on here is because your particular position is one of the positions that you interface with literally every other department on set just about yeah like yeah i mean you're talking to the director you're talking to the actors you're talking like you said to the sound department you're kind of in the middle of a whole lot of different departments yeah. when you do your job part of what we wanted to bring you on here to talk about is because one of the things i get asked a lot is what is it like to be on set right mm-hmm and obviously my job on set is super boring. I just kind of sit there. I watch some monitors, occasionally talk to a director when I you know, want something to be different. But it's kind of boring. You have the job where you are running around interfacing with every department. If you could talk to our audience a little bit about what is it like to be the busiest person on set? <laughs> well, the, the best analogy for working on a film set I think I've ever heard. Imagine you're in a dark room and there is a flashlight beam constantly moving. And suddenly that beam lands on you. And you have to do your job as quickly and efficiently as possible before that light can move on. Yeah. That is exactly what it's like. So it it can be long hours of hanging out, uploading my continuity stuff. But there there are long periods of, of inactivity and then suddenly everything happens. But there are some days where the lunch break is the only time I have a chance to sit down just because so much has to get done. Uh, this episode you guys are talking about in particular, we had some ridiculously busy days. The day we shot the, the, the Tycho hostage taking, I think we did that in one, one very, very long day that involved how many of those suits for drummer do I have? Because we have this many that have been squibbed. Right but we're shooting out of order. So now I have to cut a hole and cover that one in blood. How many of those do I still have after I do that? And for something like a squib, you have to have enough of those suits on hand that if we shoot, if we blow a hole in one with a squib and the director wants another take of that, you got to have another one ready to go that they can stick the squib on and and blow a hole in another one. Well, because because the squibbing takes so long, we usually provide at least three to special effects ahead of time. Yeah. So they're they're preloaded. And so that way we have we have pieces that are say burnable. So we can burn those. They're dead, they're gone. And then we have at least two uh, hero pieces that are still on standby that we can use in the future. But with, with squibbing, ideally, you put them into the suit with the, with the fireworks on it or the squib on it. And then from that point on, they have the bullet wound. Add blood on top of that. Yeah. As opposed to, well, we're not going to squib you for two more hours, but we're going to shoot this shot of you sitting on the ground with blood pouring out of your gut now. So let's just use what you're wearing. Also, I want everybody to know that Walker is hot shit at her job. And we said earlier, it's one of the hardest jobs on set for me with my mind. And like, I would be a nightmare at that job. The con- <laughs> the continuity, whenever you see people on set, you know, they have their outfits, they got their pins, they have their ribbons, they have, they had a scuff on it five episodes earlier. They had a, a level of dirt on their outfit. Lindsay has to look at all of those outfits, all of those little details and make sure that they're completely in line with the story, with the past, and understanding the future, and knowing what's going to happen in that outfit, if something's going to happen in that outfit, have like nine or ten doubles, and then if we use all the doubles for that outfit, like we're talking now, then it's up to her. Everybody looks at her saying, hey, where's the, we we, we ran out of doubles, you got to figure it out on the fly. Yeah. Her mind is so attuned to what we're doing. I used to say, we would be on set, and I'd be like, watch this. Because I had, you know, my zipper is like at a certain place on my on my suit. Uh-huh. And I would literally, in between takes, I would just adjust it an inch. I and knew then, it. And I knew it. Soon, and she would, she would show up and be like, Err! and then, like, at, she's doing like 20 things and she'll stop and go, shh, shh, shh. And then gone. Gone to the next <laughs> job. And, and it, would, it used to make me laugh so much. So I, I just wanted to make sure everybody knows. That's a really good point. And it's exactly what uh, the reason why I wanted Lindsay to come on. Because if you think about her dealing with space stuff, yeah, she, she's got the costume. 
But the helmet belongs props. to the props department. If the if the spacesuit is going to get shot, if there's going to get holes in it, then that spacesuit has to go over to the special effects department to be squibbed up. So not only does she have a million things to keep track of, but there are huge chunks of her job that somebody else has to do something before she can do her part of it. And keeping track yeah. of where all that stuff is is a part of the job. We also get questions of, are we going to see, how much of Wes's arms are we going to see today so we knew how many of the tattoos were going to apply? Well, that's that's why I wanted to bring you on because I couldn't think of anyone on the show that on a daily basis interfaces with every other department. Yeah, when you put it that way. I mean, even even lighting, because like most of our suits have lighting effects in them. So things like where are the wires going to run in this suit so that we can put the little thing on that lights up on their shoulder. Like I can't think of a department on onset department that you didn't have to at least work some amount with. If we're putting on the space suit, we go see Lindsay. She puts the first layer of the suit on. Then you go to props. But. Sound has got to be with props in order to wire their sound within yep. props. Then you put the all the yep. props on, and then you put the helmet on. Then sound's got to be there to check to make sure you can hear and the things in the ear. Lindsay's there the whole time making sure that the props don't mess up the, the outfit. And then props is there to make sure that the props are all good. Then you have lighting coming, and then you got to walk and show your lighting into a camera, and lighting has to adjust the light from there. So there's all these different apartments, all these different people on one outfit. I remember, outfit. I remember very clearly because yeah. sound actually is always the first step um, if we're playing helmets because the the they uh, the actors always have earbuds and without that the actors can't hear. And I remember very clearly early on in season two we missed that step with Wes. I wound up shoulder deep down the back of his very very sweaty back suit trying to get this tiny little headphone cord out a little hole <laughs> in the center back of it looking at it now there's like a few different ways we could have done that easier but that was the way we were committed to admit admit that you did that on purpose so that you could reach <laughs> I, don't think we ever, I don't think we ever Just decided who it. owed each other dinner after that one <laughs> <laughs> like I, we, we both felt a little dirty at the same time by the way wes has talked many times about how sweaty those suits are you cannot overstate that so you didn't you didn't fill the suits with uh, baby powder ahead well, that, of time? See, that so would just, that would just make a paint. That would just make a paint. And that's, that's, that's hilarious. <laughs> so one of the questions that I had is, who is your least favorite person oh. on set? <laughs> we'll we'll, we'll, we'll edit tell. it out. We'll edit what, it out. Don't worry what, about it. In what... In what oh, context? Yeah, yeah. Who is the biggest diva on set? And we're just sitting around talking. We'll edit it out, dance. Don't worry about yeah. it. You're not, you're not going to say anything bad. Nobody's going to hear this. I worked with you for five years. I don't know if I trust either of you for that. <laughs> <laughs> that, <laughs> yeah, that is, that is, see, this, this is why Lindsay's that good at her job. Is She's super smart. smart. She knows not to trust us. Because we're, we're, yeah. we're totally lying right now. I just wanted to hear you talk shit about Wes, though. Um, uh, <laughs> I, can't, I couldn't say who's the biggest diva because it changes. Uh, it's, it's, every it's, every it's, it depends on moods, right? Every day, yeah, like it's, somebody's it's, in a good mood, somebody it might be in a bad yeah. mood, somebody. And sometimes it's not even about mood. It's one of the parts of of my job, and also hair and makeup's job that that people don't really think about going in is the the emotional labor of it because we have to develop a very specific kind of rapport, read yeah. where they are and what they need in the moment. Like so, Perry Chen, his first day on set was on that refugee shuttle. It was his first day with, hey, your yeah. daughter's dead. He spent two days in a very, very dark place as an actor. And I gave him as much space yeah. as I could because I didn't want to invade where he needed to be as a performer. That's one of the other things that we have to figure out in our job is what do they need from us? How do I meet them where they are to make their time on set as easy as possible? So when you get someone who is a diva or is in a high maintenance place, it's figuring out where is this high maintenance coming from? What is it that they need to feel good about where they are? Is it they just need a little bit of extra attention? Are they just a garbage fire of a human being? Figure out which one it is and go from there. Because I've worked with both. <laughs> 
not going to say who, but I've worked with both. I'm glad you brought that up because it's not something I think most people would realize about that job, that so much of that job is sort of figuring out Mm -hmm. the emotional space that the actor is in and trying to be like the perfect little adjunct to that. You're not doing too much, but you're doing enough that they get the stuff that they need. Yeah, it's not something I had thought about, but it makes a lot of sense because a lot of actors Mm -hmm. do get very in their own head for emotional scenes like that. They need to stay in a very specific emotional space and you don't want to knock them out of that. You don't want to you don't want to be, hey, I'm yeah. going to tell you 15 jokes now while they're trying to like stay in that dark place. That's the great thing with a crew like we had. We had a just a phenomenal crew, but everybody on set are storytellers and they understand yeah. story. Like Lindsay and I, we talk a bunch about books that she loved and she's very involved with the show and understands everybody on the set, the lighting, the sound. They know what the scene is. They know what the scene is about. They know what the actors have to do in that scene. And it's a team effort. Like everybody comes together and works together. Everybody's supports each other to make the thing happen. That's really impressive with a good crew is how in tune they are with the story and the scene and everybody knows how to use their expertise and their job to enhance the story in their own way. It's it's a rare gift to get to work on something that is that you care about and is actually this good. Um, I working on a film crew, particularly the shooting crew, it's a bit like um, joining the army and running away with the circus at the same time. We're, we're a bunch of carnies. We, we have, we have relationship <laughs> and commitment issues. You know, we have everything we do is short term. So you can work on a, three different shows in a year and not care about any of them. Um, but, but to get the chance to work on yeah. something that, that you care about, that is this high quality and is, beloved by as many people as who loved it is it's a rare gift in someone's career so those of us who bought in bought in big it was an advantage that we got to hang on to so much of our crew from season to season one thing that i know a lot of fans of the show uh that now that they know you work in the costume department are going to have a lot of questions about is how did you keep track of uh show race <laughs> 4000 outfits uh, well the beauty of show race <laughs> outfits is she rarely wears the same thing twice which is a huge help for me. With Ava Sarala, every time you see her, it's usually a different day. So her, she would have a different costume every time you saw her. And in terms of maintaining the way it looked on her body, that was a different challenge because she, for the first couple of seasons, she's mostly in sari. And sari is a living, yeah. breathing organism of a garment. It is meant to move and change as the wearer moves and changes, which is a nightmare. <laughs> For continuity. <laughs> so the, the purple and blue one that she's wearing when she first meets Coachyard, she's wearing for the first couple episodes of the season. Probably, I think, wore the most that season was, was one of the hardest for me to wrangle because that thing that went over her arm was always different and trying to make sure that the folds at least looked the same way. By the end of the season, we actually started sewing her into things. So whatever was draped over her shoulder, so I actually start sewing things together so that there was no way for it to move or change because otherwise I'd be lost. As it was, I was still in there between almost every single time they would call cut. I'd be in there fixing and make sure she looked her best, which was always a joy to do. She's the human embodiment of one plus one equals three. She's such a generous spirit that even if she spend the entire day following her around and fussing with her clothes, you don't feel tired. Well, you brought up an interesting question about being mic'd. You know who I'm, I miss old prison hands. And oh, you know, hands. Thing, it, it's really <laughs> funny. Like every, every, every sound guy is a big burly dude with a big old beard and they got to put their hands in the most sensitive parts of your, you know, person to get the mic in there. And every morning, yeah. I don't know. I, I don't know if it was winter or, but like the, the guy that was with us for the first four or five years, I called him prison hands. Cause I feel these rough calloused hands going <laughs> down my pant leg to, to put the, to put the, and I was like, is this what the prison's like? Uh, I love that. I love him. What, what, remind me the, his name, Lindsay. It was Sean. Sean. Yeah. Sean. Oh, prison hands. Yeah. Sean. He and I, I'm, I'm still amazed that he and I never got uh, <laughs> reprimanded because we would, we would dance into the innuendo with conversations every single day. We, we verged on the inappropriate a lot. He oh, had, yeah. Um, like, think of, I mean, look, we should tell yeah. some of those, you know, we make sure that the set is yeah. fun and we have a good time with it, but there's a lot of, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of funny sayings that happen that we, we don't let people forget. So what, what are some of your favorites? 
let's just say for starters, we called Sean prison hand. Yeah. <laughs> like already, like that gives you a sense of the tone. And the only, and the only reason um, I was drawing a uh, blank on his name is because Sean uh, betrayed us this season. He didn't work with us. He went, yeah, he, he went somewhere else. So when somebody leaves us, I, I, they, I wipe them out of oh, my Oh yeah. When somebody leaves the show, they're dead yeah. to me. They're yeah. dead to you. Like yeah. I know everybody's name <laughs> unless you leave the show. Yeah. Then you're dead. Right. Then you're dead. You also called him prison hands for like two years. So it's like, oh, entirely prison hands. if you'd forgotten the real name. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> At some point in season two, one of our dear ADs, who's also been with us since season two, Byron Ingram. Ah, uh, Byron. Bless Lord him. Byron. He is, oh yeah. And there was a day we were shooting something that involved a klaxon of some sort. So usually someone would call as the cue for the actors, just alarm, alarm. Byron went, alarm, alarm. <laughs> and it lasted for three years. So every time something go wrong, people just get, start going, alarm. <laughs> An arm. <laughs> and it just, it became one of my favorite inside jokes. I'm trying, I'm racking my brain because we had so many over there, but nothing, nothing's coming. But, they, but, but all, of, all of them were, the thing is, they're all, you have to be there moments. The last question I had for you was mm-hmm. because I wasn't up there in Canada this year because of the COVID thing. And you were missed. What was it like on set? With COVID, I think people are, are curious about that. Like, we shot a season of the show with the COVID mm-hmm. restrictions. What did that look like? How, like, if I had shown up there, how, how different would it have been for me? What was going <laughs> on? I don't even know. I'm working on my third show now under COVID. The, the, the weird thing is every, every show has slightly different protocols um, in terms of where you can go, how much freedom movement do you have. The beginning of The Expanse was much, much more restrictive than it was by the end, just because we had to figure out what worked and what didn't work. Bullshit. It was restricted the whole way through. (laughs) But, like, in the beginning, I wasn't ever supposed to go on set at all. Uh, I was supposed to do you guys' finals at your chairs and then never actually go on set. Oh, serious? Because it it was never like that That lasted three days. I I can't do it this way. I I just can't. Yeah. But, like, you know how we we always used to park up on the second deck of the Rossi? Like, half the crew would be up there. We couldn't do that anymore. Um, I couldn't hang out at, at Video Village with the director and Lewin and as much as I had before. Lunches were very different. We couldn't all sit around communal tables and actually have conversations with each other. We were shouting at each other through plexiglass. It got, in some ways, close to normal in a way by the end because we found we found a way to laugh again. That was the hardest part, was the, the not being able to see each other's faces. So you spend yeah. a whole season with people like this and you only see eyes. Yeah. It, for me, because there were so many people I knew from before, I knew had an idea of what was happening under there. So people weren't as strange to me. But for, for people who were new, it was hard to make connections because you don't know what anybody looks like. You don't see faces. You can't read those I, I, cues. I, there, I work with people um, the first time, and I still don't know what they look like yeah. <laughs> through the whole season. Yeah, so it's it's different. It's really different. It's kind of a sad way to end the show in that we couldn't enjoy each other's company as much as we normally would have liked. No rap party, not as well, I'm much. Well, I'm going to throw a rap party yeah. at some point, and only my favorite people are getting invited. <laughs> Damn so it. If, if you don't get invited, you should definitely read into it. So, uh, Ty, I will sum up what it was like to work under COVID. Take everything that was fun about filming everything that was yeah. fun on the expanse and on the set and just take that away, take it all away. And then you'll see what it was like filming under COVID. I did not like filming under COVID. I'm sure nobody. Liked I, it. I, I had some idea of what it was going to be and I did not miss not. So filming. for me, here's the thing. One of the things that I love most about what we do and the work is to see the people that you became friends with over the years and hanging out and creating this thing together. And I draw energy from that. When I come, I want to see people. I want to have our jokes and laugh. And and then that's how I start to get energy. And it puts me in a creative space. The more, the sillier I am, I need to pull that to bring into my, to the work that I'm doing. If I come in and it's serious and we literally, we had people coming around you know, telling you to put your mask, like, you you know, you'd be in the middle of a good story and it's like, put your mask on. He's not in your zone. You can't talk to him or go here, do that. And it just, for me, it just sucked all the fun out of shooting. I understand what you're saying now, Lindsay, because towards the end of it, we were like, all right, fuck it. You know, like we're going to, you know, you know, we kind of, yeah. we ended up, you know, we were responsible and, and, and safe, but we, we allowed ourselves the, the human side of shooting to, well, to happen. We did have one scare, right? We had one crew member that they thought might have gotten it, but that was it. Is that um, right? There, there was one um, 
one positive on set and we got yeah. lucky in that it was caught quickly. It wasn't passed on. Like we, we didn't, we never had an outbreak. It didn't spread beyond that one person. Um, and given how high cases were while we were shooting, we got very, very lucky. And I think it's... So, so it seems like the, the restrictions were, were brutal to deal with, but they actually did work. They did the thing we needed them to do. Yeah. They did. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to a version of this, of doing this that is not, not quite as restricted. Yeah where you actually get to get to see people and be with people again in a, in a nice, free, easy and way. And I will say, you know, we're just venting and we're talking about how, you know, it wasn't as fun as it normally is, but I am thankful, you know, Manny and Lewin and all the guys that busted their ass to put all these mm-hmm. protocols in place. Overall, my, my feeling of the season is gratitude because I'm thankful that we were allowed to shoot and make this show and be able to finish it the way we did. And also the fact that we did it and nobody got sick and we were able to get through the whole thing. I mean, that is a yeah. monumental accomplishment uh, yeah. that they did. Yeah. So, you know, congratulations to that. I'm just being uh, just grumpy that I didn't get to hang out. <laughs> well, <laughs> Lindsay yeah. wasn't there for season one, but in season one, when, when somebody got oh. norovirus, yeah. it went through the entire crew. I think it must have hit like a hundred people. Um, you know, Steven and Wes were both sick. Tom Thomas was sick. Everybody on the crew was sick. So you see how quickly an infectious disease can pass through a film crew and picturing that happening with COVID, that's terrifying. I'm so glad that didn't happen. At that percentage, we would have had some fatalities. Yeah. And the fact that we didn't is amazing. And really, as Wes was saying, it speaks to how well Manny and Lewin and all those guys did setting up the protocols and making sure it didn't happen. Yeah, no, it's... Yeah. Um, it would have sucked to have like on the last season of the show to have somebody die. It, yeah. And, and the film industry in general is very lucky in that it was able to pick up as easily as it did again. I mean, there's countless people in the live events industry who are still waiting. Yep. We're, we're lucky. We're incredibly lucky that we've been able to continue. On that note, do you have any projects you're working on right now that you want to let the audience know about? Or do you have any stage stuff happening? Because I know that's your first love. Uh, no, it's stage in, in Canada has been since, since March. So that's still um, shut down. Still shut down. But I am... Working on a uh, a Netflix feature called Ivy as the assistant costume designer. So I am I'm trying to get back to my more creative oh, roots. Nice, congrats. Thank you. Um, not to say that I won't still come back to set should should the Rossi ever take flight again. But uh, <laughs> but I am trying to to actively get back into the more more creative side of the career. Do you have anything else, Wes? Uh, no, I think uh, it's just so good to see you and hear your voice. And uh, we've had such so many great times together. And uh, and. You are yeah. so worthy of this crew. Shout out. You're, you're, you're phenomenal at your job, and, and, uh, and you were so instrumental in keeping us together, especially me. <laughs> you, you, remember, you remember that time I lost my gloves? <laughs> like, right Always. before her. I was like, tell me that story. So you're shooting in the quarry, season four, and base camp is a 20-minute drive minimum. So if I need anything, it's 20 minutes away. And it was cold, so we had given the cast gloves. I don't remember how close we were to shooting, but we were we were close enough to, to be getting into the prepared. So just like, hey, uh, so Wes, do you have your gloves? And he checked his pockets and only pulled out one. <laughs> and didn't know where the other one had fallen out. And we're talking like a set roughly the size of a football field. And it could be anywhere. And I don't have a backup. Because usually we have doubles on everything, and I just hadn't brought them with me that day. So, like, I can't put them on camera with just one glove. What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? Fortunately, I had some fake, like, fleece gloves. So at least I could put something on his hand, and hopefully we were far enough away that they wouldn't notice it wasn't the same as the one on his other hand. And then the following season, the first thing I asked him when we went to go do a camera test in the city was, Wes, you had your gloves? <laughs> yeah. I would have just said, hey, Wes, for the rest <laughs> of the day, you just have to keep that hand jammed down the yeah. front of your pants. You, you mean how it is normally when the camera's not rolling? Yes. Yeah. When the camera's not rolling. Also, I just need you to do uh, that well, when I, the camera's I just rolling. Threatened him with, I threatened him with a mitten string. Yeah. I told him that was going to happen. If he lost another one, there would be a mitten string. <laughs> also, Walker kept me alive one night. Uh, the you know, Ty, Ty, yeah. Ty thought it'd be funny to write me stripping down in below zero weather and the standing barefoot on the <laughs> Yeah. Hey, I didn't think it was funny. It, it was, was funny. I was actually, I was listening in. And I was going to say, Ty, you have made several people in this cast drop trout. In some cases, oh, at yeah. night, in the winter, outside. The least you can do yes. is the same. Correct. So let's see. I, I, so that, and also that <laughs> night, remember I had the blood sprayed on my face. 
And a guy, you know, oh my god, the, 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 I was speaking with a guy. He had this hose, and he and he spent like mm-hmm. forty five minutes telling me like, "What now? This blast is going to blast you in the face. You just got to yeah. be ready." Da da da. And at that time, I'm like, I'm shaking. I'm, I'm like, just blast me, bro. Just blast my face. Let's go. Let's, and so, uh, yeah. So then it's like this thing they've been talking about all night long. This thing is going to blast me in the face. Get ready. Yeah. It goes three, two, and I'm standing there. I'm cold. Three, two, one, and he goes. And just like Please. like two two drops <laughs> fall out onto the snow. It doesn't even get to me. It doesn't even get to my face. And I said, "You've been yeah. talking to me forty five minutes." And he got this steely eyed look. At, you know, his eyes got kind of. Gla- it's like, oh, okay. Uh, he, I think he like looked at it as like a challenge. He's like, "I'm gonna blow this fucker's head off." You know. So then we we reset. <laughs> we do everything. I do this. And they say three, two. One and that guy must have put everything he had in it. Was, boom! So much. And just, I just literally <laughs> like it was like somebody. T- it was like uh, in uh, in Carrie when when the pig blood drops yeah. on her on her head. Like I just got <laughs> just drenched in blood. I don't know how you kept a straight face on that second take. Yeah, because it was so much more. Because the first one they lost, they talked about it for too long, and it just lost all its pressure and just sad little spurt. And then I mean, look. That, that, but that's any time yes. a guy spends forty five minutes bragging yeah. about his equipment, you can guarantee it's going to be disappointed. And we we all called him on it, and we laughed, and yeah. we were making fun of him. Yeah. And then he was like, "All right, all right, motherfucker," and he cranked that bitch and put everything into it. To him. And it was literally yep. like John Travolta dropped a, a bucket of red pig's blood on me, and I just got completely drenched in there. And it, yeah. it, it but it worked; it was great, and it was a thing, but. It was yeah. already zero below. I don't have any yeah. clothes on. Oh, and then they dropped this like wet uh, pig's blood on me. One last thing, though, I'm going to give a shout out to Lindsay for because, of course, she didn't ever have to like dress me. But the one thing she did for me was she made sure I was warm. Lindsay was always whenever we were outside on those shoots, Lindsay would always come find me and go. Do you have good enough gloves? Do you have enough socks? Do you need? And she would have the little, uh, uh, the little yeah. chemical hot pockets that you kind of you, you bang around. You could stick them in your glove or in your shoe or whatever. She would always come find me every hour. Go have you have the ones you had worn off? Do you need new ones? So like even people who are not part of her job, because I'm not part of Lindsay's job when she's on set. She was still making sure everybody was taken care of. Everybody was warm. There are some nights there that only I only survived, survived the night You're because sitting next to a heater around with little hot and, and, a, and a warming tent <laughs> with a running car nearby whenever you get too cold. But I will say, I, I okay. want to really communicate. Lindsay works her ass off. And when we talking about a night like this, this is an all nighter and it's freezing. And she's not only keeping the yep. cast. She's keeping the whole crew and everybody involved warm. And you can see Lindsay walking and you can, all you see is like two little feet <laughs> in a hood and they're just buried <laughs> in coats. She has all her arms out like this, which is yeah, like, like a mountain, mountain of, of coats, coats and like handy coats. And you do a take. She comes and gets everybody their coats. And, and then when we're done and then when we're getting ready to take takes, she takes all the coats back because we're not wearing coats in the shot. And then she's standing there and waiting for it. And as soon as you're done, she walks and she gives everybody back their jackets. I just, I was just like, man, this is that's hard work, really tough job. And uh, and thank you, thank you for taking care of us through the whole the whole seven years. You're very welcome. I mean, Ty, I was always yep. worried about you because we always have giant parkas, and you just had that one sad little coat. <laughs> well, you no, my it wasn't a sad <laughs> coat. That was my that was my Portland drug dealer coat. That coat <laughs> never is awesome. said it wasn't cool. Just the rest of us are all like armed and massive. Hey, what 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 parka you got? I dress in layers. Well, what man. was colder in your boxers in the snow? <laughs> Or the night we shot where you had to sit in the snow and talk to that Hutch. One. Or talking to Hutch, sitting in yeah. a, 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 <laughs> That was yeah. fucking cold. If you had water and you threw it out, it would freeze before it hit the ground. That's how cold it was that night. So you wanted to, to join us on our top five? Yeah. All right. So, uh, yeah, absolutely I do. So, I, so this top five is inspired by uh, the Belters taking everybody hostage and holding them off. And so it made me start thinking about my favorite hostage movies. Now, this is a large one because there is a lot of great hostage movies. And one of the things that I love about doing these lists where sometimes we'll do scenes, sometimes we'll do moments, sometimes we do full movies. Some of the things I love is like you think, oh, hostage movies. But you go back in the past, you're like, Jesus Christ, like there's so many great hostage movies. 
So this is going to be challenging to come up with the top five. Well, I already know. I already know the number one. I already the, number one is so obvious. Yeah, I don't even have to think. I, I, about I think it. we're you and I are unanimous on number one. I yeah, think that's yeah. that goes without saying. That's that's done. And that's that's done. done. That's done. Yeah. yeah. All right. So so tell me the rest. Everybody's of them. only fighting for number two now. Okay. Yeah. At best. At best. And silver medals are the only medals available yeah. now. So I'm not going to say number one because Ty and I know what yeah. number one is, but this is the yeah. pool. Right. And then Lindsay and Ty, what happens is I'll kind of read a pool and then you guys contribute to the things that I forgot or whatever. And then we'll try to take top five out of that. So there's the number one that Ty and I are talking about. Yep. Speed, dog day afternoon, man oh, on yeah, fire, misery, Stephen King. And also King movies always get like just because of Stephen King, they always get it like a higher uh, taken red eye. Now, Ty, have you ever seen the movie Fortress? The Rachel, yes. the, the Australian movie Fortress? Yes, yes, With I have. Rachel Ward, love this movie. Uh, it has a Red Dawn kind of feel to it. The Room, Us, and Get Out, two Jordan Peele movies. Uh, Hateful Eight, Don't Breathe. You saw that, right, Ty? Don't Breathe? Yep. Ruthless People. I love. I love Ruthless I, People. That movie cracks me the hell I, up. That movie... To that this was, that day, was supposed to be my wild card. Oh, yeah. Ruthless People? To this day, that movie still cracks yeah. me up. The line the cop says, like, this may be the stupidest man alive. I think we should <laughs> shoot him. That's, I, even just thinking about that scene makes me laugh. God, I love that movie. We could do a whole podcast just on that movie. Um, yeah, that's a great and movie. And number one, Strangers, A Perfect World, Toy Soldiers, Breakdown, anything with Kurt Russell, if you can squeeze him in there, we're going to do that. Uh, the hu- <laughs> a breakdown is actually a good movie. Though. It's a like phenomenal, breakdown. but it's also got Kurt Russell yeah. in it. So it's that yeah. makes it a masterpiece. Uh, yeah. The Human Centipede. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that one's not getting in my top five. Sorry. Have you seen it? I yes. have not seen it. Uh, Clover, but I want to hear about it. Cloverfield Lane, Wolf Creek, yeah. Old Boy, Last House on the Left. I'm not a fan of these movies, but I'm including because, you know, the fans would be like, what about this movie? Uh, Saw. Yeah. Dust Till Dawn, Silence of the Lambs, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Split. We, there's probably three pages we could fill up, but d- is there any big ones that I forgot? Um, um, I'm a fan of Panic Room and The Negotiator. I was thinking about The Negotiator. You think that... It, yeah, is, Negotiator's pretty it's good. A, it's yeah. a great movie, but it's not yeah. a top five movie. No, but it, it should I be on we the were list. Just talking about the pool. Yeah. yeah, it should be in the pool. Yeah. You also didn't do Under Siege. That should be in the pool. Oh, forgive me, Ty. This is the second time I, I left out under siege. I'm, I'm going to grab my Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also a fan of um, uh, Dead Calm. was a really a, a cool one. Like uh, Billy Bates yeah, got yeah, it, it, on the boat. Yeah, yeah. No, it, it's, it's a very tense movie. And I guess in a way it is yeah. kind of a hostage movie. Cause yeah, under, under siege he, has got to be. It. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you're right. The negotiator yeah. with Samuel Jackson. I forgot about that. Yeah. And what about Panic Room? Like, they kind of take themselves hostage. The jo- but- uh, Jodie Foster one? Yeah. yeah. I wasn't a big... Were you a big fan of that movie, Ty? I, I was not. I, I, w- I wasn't in it's, love with it's that got a, It's got a special place in my heart. <laughs> I mean, I do like Jodie Foster. Yeah, and, so. and we like movies that have special places in heart. So if, if it has a special place Speaking in Speaking of which, heart, I love that you called out... I love that you called out Toy Soldiers. Yeah. <laughs> I'd almost forgotten about that movie. I'd almost forgotten about that movie until today, but I watched the out of that on Super Channel as a kid. It, 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 I love yeah. that movie. It was kind of the slowing of the momentum. So we were talking to Jason Patrick last episode. And we were talking about the 80s, like where kids mm-hmm. started starring in movies. And it was about those things. And then it kind of, the Toy Soldier, whatever, like it was like those kid themed adventure type movies and adult situations that kind of, that was kind of like yeah. the, the, but I loved it. I love that movie. Uh, so should we yeah, say number one, Ty? Yeah. Die yeah. Hard. Yeah, of course it's Die Hard. Die Hard's of the course. greatest hostage movie of all I think, time. You know what? I think if I, I, I think if I would have brought up this hostage movie, do I, I mean, this just shows the reason that Ty and I love each other and, and have, are having an affair over our wives is that the fact that I said top you know, <laughs> to hostage movies and he immediately knew what number one is and we did, it was a connection. Yeah, I mean... Of number one, and we didn't even like it was like a, a it, we didn't even have to talk about it. We knew what number one was. What argument could there be for any other movie being the number one hostage movie? Like I don't even know what that argument is. I don't even 
Like it doesn't, it doesn't even make, make sense. sense. And, we, and that person wouldn't be allowed on the show. I have an argument. Oh, 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 oh Clint. Here, okay, Clint. Here's my argument. I don't think it's a hostage movie if the protagonist is not either the hostage taker or the hostage. That's my argument. I don't. Th- I, that, that that's just not just because there not a, are hostages. It's a ridiculous it's a argument. Hostage movie. Get out of here. Nobody cares. It's the entire movie is about trying to rescue. Yeah, hostages. it's a hostage movie, and in a way, he is. That's a, weak sauce. But in a way, he's a he, dog day <laughs> afternoon. It's about the hostage takers. Funny games. The the Michael Haneke movie. Like that's that's a funny games is movie, a good one, right? So so you're saying a movie which is all about a guy trying to rescue his wife who is a hostage is not a hostage movie? Yeah, I, come I, on, I, come the on. The whole I think movie it's not is a about pure hostage movie. The whole movie's a well, some of these like Science of the Lambs isn't a pure hostage movie. I think you guys, but the whole movie can't resist putting Die Hard at movie. the top of lists. I think that's what's happening. <laughs> no, but Clint, but but isn't. Isn't a hostage movie a movie in which the plot revolves around hostages? Yes, that is correct, yeah, Lindsay. Thank you for thank schooling, you. Clint. I, I feel like I've just lost a friend for life somehow, uh, or gained two. I'm not sure. But no, Clint, Lindsay Clint, is deleting you from my phone. Let, Lindsay, trust me. Clint, <laughs> Clint's a lousy friend. Don't worry about it. You, this is you, true. you, you got the true real <laughs> friendships here. Um, but right. listen, <laughs> if if there wasn't hostages in the movie, the movie wouldn't happen. You know what? Uh, That's correct. Y- you put Fargo on the list. Fargo is one of my favorite movies of all goddamn time. It's not a hostage movie, even though they're holding his wife, right? I, I think it, I think it could. But, you could argue that. Well, but the protagonist is not trying to rescue her. That's not what she's doing. She's trying to figure out who murdered those two people up in Brainerd. Fair. Yeah. If if the entire movie was about Marge trying to rescue that woman, then it is a hostage. Strike two, Clint. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I'll stop do, this recording right now. <laughs> <laughs> but do you, do you can see do you can see that Die Hard is a, it, it can be can be in a hostage movie list. I, I can see you can put it on the list, but if you're talking about like, okay, if you're but it, but if I were to make a list of you know greatest action movies of all time, or you know movie, uh, oh, you, know, you could be you could be in multiple right? lists. You know, sure, sure, sure. Die Hard is in multiple yeah. lists, and it, you know, and and you're right, it is it does get exciting when I'm like, oh, Die Hard fits in this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's best yes. Christmas movie ever made. Yeah. Best hostage right. movie right. ever made. All right. All right. Best action movie ever made. Best Bruce Willis movie ever made. Uh, what about Red Eye <laughs> with Rachel? That's a, a moving, a moving. You think they're holding the whole plane movie. hostage? Sure. If by that by that uh, measure yeah. is um, Air Force One a hostage movie? Yes, it is. Uh, yes, it is. I, I Air Force One is absolutely a hostage movie. <laughs> and and what's what's the one where Steven Seagal gets Air Force sucked one. out of the airplane? No. no, 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 no. That, that, no, Air Force oh, One is oh, the yeah, one yeah. with Harrison uh, Ford. Yeah. The Steven Seagal uh, one is... Um, uh, Kurt, Kurt Russell's in that one. Uh, I'm coming back like, only to say this. Wes, you also said The Room instead of Room. It's Room. Room is also the movie. audience the is, room the yeah. Yeah. is the greatest comedy <laughs> I, I know, ever made. I, I noticed my <laughs> mistake when I said it, but I was like, hopefully nobody will call me out. But you two assholes, I, you can't you can't make a mistake over here. <laughs> no, you can't let it go. Um, can't let it go. I, I mean, it's being forced to watch the room against your will, like a hostage situation. Yeah, that's no? true. That's a good point. Reach. Um, <laughs> The, the room is Tommy Wiseau yeah. holding everyone. Yeah. So, so die, die Hard takes number one. Hey, uh, do you guys think Get yeah. Out and uh, Us, the t- two Jordan Pills movies, th- those are hostage, right? Uh, no. I think Us is more of a hostage movie than Get Out is. <laughs> just got- I'm, I am Clint, get I'm out a and- wimp and I have... Go ahead, sorry. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a wimp and I don't, I don't watch the horror films because, like... I can't. I haven't seen either of the Jordan Peele ones. I've read a little bit about them. I would say... I don't know if Get Out is a hostage movie. I think it becomes one. It's a kidnap movie. Get, out, becomes, get Out's not a hostage movie, it becomes but, a kidnap but us movie. is. But you, okay, there, but, uh, there's a, hold, but there's another one you okay, need to add on, to your list. I wanna, if we're before doing we leave this topic, Go ahead. in Get Out, literally, you're trapped in your own body. They're being held hostage in their own body. No? I, I suppose there is an argument to be made for that, but I don't know. That's all right. We're all on right, we're on thin right. ice. But at I that love point, those I movies, and I love Jordan Peele. Yeah. Um, uh, which one did I, did I leave out? Yeah. Ty, 
Well, actually, now that I'm thinking about it, it's actually not a hostage movie. I, I, I'm a big fan of the movie You're Next, but they're not actually hostages. The the bad yeah. guys are just trying to murder them. They wind up locked in the house, but they're trying see- to be murdered. They're not really hostages. And by the way, Wes, no. did you know that I was held hostage? What? This is a true story. This sounds like a setup for a joke, but it's not. True story. I held hostage. Wait, talk about, about it. Where? During, well, a, during, during it. an armed robbery. Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe we'll do it in a different episode because that story will take a while. But yeah. So, so later when we're telling our, our stories of the you worst things that have happened to us, you can't I'll tell come my story in and say, about being hey, Wes, you know, I was held hostage once during our Friday. Dude, dude, we're two hours into this. I, right, uh, this right, story well, then takes we're going to tell. Right, since we're at the end of this, you know, we're at a time zone, but I'm going to just yep. know you're going to tell that story next episode. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I'll tell that one. Yep. Oh, there's one movie that I couldn't remember the name of. Do you ever see that movie? Where these people are trapped in a house and the lions are like eating them, the eating them one by one. Are you talking about the one with uh, Melanie Griffith and her mom? Uh, 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 shit, what's her name? The one who was in the birds. Um, oh, Tippy Hedren. Tippy Hedren. Uh, you're, ta- you're talking about that one where the whole movie is like on their nature preserve and they're surrounded by lions and tigers and stuff. Is that the one you're Clint, talking? Do you about? know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I believe it's the one that Ty is talking about. Is it called Roar? Maybe or. Roar. Yeah, that's the name but of it. It's Roar. like an old yep. movie, right? Like an old. It's like it is. A, yeah, yep. I, that movie terrified yeah. me when I was a kid and watched. It terrified it, dude. Like like fifty people got mauled by lions while they were making that movie. Uh, Melanie Griffith had her scalp torn open and had to have plastic surgery, and and Tippi Hedren got her leg broken by an elephant <laughs> oh in the filming God. of that movie. Yeah, there's a scene in the movie where an elephant is picking Tippi Hedren up by the leg and shaking uh-huh. her. She's legit. She's screaming. Those are not movie screams. She is screaming because that that elephant has snapped her leg. Well, then that movie <laughs> should be on the list because they're a hostage in real life and in the movie by wild yeah. animals. No, you know, that, that, the, the making of that movie is one of the stupidest and most dangerous things that's ever <laughs> happened, and I'm fascinated by it. There's so, a documentary about like, it. The guy who made that movie was just an idiot. So uh, yeah. my vote for number two is Dog Day Afternoon. Dog Day Afternoon is a fantastic hostage-taking movie. Yeah. It's, it's Pacino at his best. Firing on all cylinders. That phone call yep. when he calls, uh, what's the, what was the actor's name that played his uh, lover? Chris Sarandon? Yeah, you're right. You were right, Lindsay. Chris Sarandon. Uh, you know, Chris Sarandon was the vampire in Fright Night. But the, uh, the yes. phone call when they, it's just heartbreaking. You know, the love that they had for you. Al Pacino crushed that movie. That was such a phenomenal. And Sidney Lumet, was, you know, was firing on all his cylinders and they shot it. And it's a great movie. All right. So third place, I would argue, I mean, Speed's got to be on the top five, right? I think Speed is fun. I don't think it's a great yeah, movie. Yeah, it's true. Man of Fire is a great movie and it's. Okay. Now, are you talking about the original? I'm or t- the remake? The remake, Denzel Washington. Okay, see, I like the, I like the original better. I don't think I've I seen thought, the original. What was the original one? It's the same story, um, but it was made in the 70s. Uh-huh. Uh, I, I think the original is a better movie. The remake was, I love Denzel Washington. He's a, one of the greatest living actors. And so anything he's in is good just because he's in it. But Tony Scott went through this like hyper cut a period in filmmaking where every every scene had 47 hyperkinetic cuts in it. I hate that style of filmmaking and and I find that movie unwatchable because it's just so like lens flare, avid flare, 16 cuts. It's like yeah. It's, it's like Jesus Christ, dude, calm the fuck down. It's it's the same thing that happened to that movie Domino, which I find uh, unwatchable. Yeah. I find it unwatchable because yeah. of the way it's shot. I yeah. I hate that style of editing. I agree with you, and uh, but I think it doesn't. It, it didn't hurt the movie. I think the movie's phenomenal, and I and and when you say uh, I think I think Denzel Washington's performance is phenomenal. Yeah, when you say that you think yeah. he's one of the greatest living actors, is that how you introduce me when when I'm not around? Is that how you when you discuss things and talk? About um, <laughs> mostly, I describe you as this guy I know who used to be in the navy. <laughs> um. <laughs> So Lindsay, you got to help us break the tie. Do you want? Uh, I haven't seen. The, uh-huh. I haven't seen the original Man on Fire. Have you seen it? The original Man on Fire. I regret to say that I. You guys have seen a lot more movies than I have. Generally speaking, as a rule, I have rarely known the remake to surpass. Oh no! It wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't in the seventies. It was actually in the eighties. 
Um, and the star is Scott Glenn in the Ooh. in the part that oh god yes, and Scott, Scott Glenn, Glenn is always fantastic. Wins. Scott Glenn Scott is Glenn fantastic. Always wins. All right, so yeah. the the eighties version Man on Fire is is number three. Scott Glenn's half the reason I keep watching Silverado. Yeah, well, Silverado is a great movie. It's a classic movie. I love that movie so much. <laughs> so number four, Lindsay, what do you think about number four? What should be number four? Do you mean read the pool again? No, but I feel like we gotta get ruthless people into the top five. Ah, you're exactly right. I totally wasn't thinking about that. So. Yeah. So number four is for sure ruthless yeah. people. That's why I love that movie. Yeah. And and I would say that the actress and singer who is the prisoner in that Beth, movie, Bette Midler. Bette Midler. Thank you. Bette yeah, I, I think Bette Midler would win a prize for maybe the best hostage oh, ever. Gosh, she's so good. At yeah. That. When she when she starts watching all the workout videos and getting in <laughs> yeah. shape just so that she can kick her husband's ass, <laughs> fucking amazing. It's, it's also. So incredibly 80s that it all happens because Danny DeVito stole the design for a miniskirt. Yes. Like that's that's what kicks it all off. And then it all gets okay again because Helen because Bette Midler gets skinny and she can wear the gowns that Helen Slater designed. And I just love it. It makes me happy. It's so the colorful. stakes couldn't be lower. Yeah. I, know. I love it. I miss Danny DeVito. Like I miss like when like if I, if you go back and watch Romance in the Stone or or ruthless people. He he oh, yeah. he makes me laugh. Dude, or even Taxi. Watch Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Yeah. Danny DeVito yeah. is incredibly funny in that show. Is he makes me laugh more than anyone else on that show? Have you seen the show like from from the beginning to the end? From have you are you a, a avid I, yeah? I mean I've I've watched yes. I I saw the all the early seasons of it. Yes, because I've been contemplating jumping in. I've never seen. An episode of well, it. at this point, it's got 307 seasons, oh so my. it takes a while to get through. <laughs> but, but honestly, the first five or six seasons are the funniest seasons they did. So, what kind of like, even it, if you is it like Archer type humor? Like, what kind of tone is the? It's its own thing. You gotta you gotta check it out. Yeah. It's it's completely its own thing. Oh, yeah, that's it's cool. it's and what and Danny DeVito shows up, I think, in season two. Uh huh. And once he shows up, it just elevates every moment of that show. All right, I got. He's, I got to watch. He's that. so funny because yeah. TV is his. That's his strike zone. Because Taxi, yep. his character in Taxi, I, and I did watch all the taxis, and yep. he kills me. He is so funny in he Taxi. Is so funny, God, yeah. Um, if yep. you, if you, I mean, ever he, just he, he's done some great movies too, though. Because uh, have you've seen um, Twins? Get Shorty, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Great movie, and he's and he's. Fucking awesome in it. Did you see the movie he directed? Uh, I know he's directed a few, but uh, the one I'm talking about is War of the Roses. Yes, I have seen War of the Roses. Uh, uh, a, a, a little dark. A little, yeah. <laughs> I have a nostalgia because I watched it, on, but it's not, it doesn't fire on all cylinders. But I do like seeing Michael Douglas and Danny DeVito together. They've been best friends for years. And, uh, well, and, and, uh, and the Kathleen lead actress Turner. who's also in. Kathleen, Kathleen Turner, Turner tight. Am I ru- Kathleen, t- Kathleen Turner tight? Am I rubbing off on you and Clint? Because you and Clint usually know, like you're, you know, I'm the one that's like, who's, what's the name, what's the, and my, you guys my, are like, my, my memory for names has gotten so bad because I'm old as fuck, yeah, and I'm just drunk all the time, right? So my memory for names is terrible. Oh, now. Okay, yeah. we've also spent years with you using us as Google, Wes. Look shit up. <laughs> yeah, I literally, I literally use Clint as Google. Um, yeah, Clint is Clint is Google. That's his job. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm going to make a, a vote, a nostalgia vote, and a sentimental vote for number five, and that's the Australian Fortress, the the 1985 Rachel Ward Fortress. I love that movie. I've seen it over and over as a kid. It's an incredible, and I think it's ripe for a remake. You know, it's these. Have you have you seen this movie, Lindsay? I don't think I have. Oh, you could. I, I mean, I, there's also there's also yeah. an argument to be made, and this is going to p- piss Clint off. There's an argument to be made that Escape from New York is a hostage movie because the president is being held hostage, and Snake, his only job is to go into New York and rescue the hostage from the Duke of New York. You don't even believe that, Kai. I mean, You're just baiting me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. We, there's an argument to be made. We also haven't discussed Die Hard 2. Everyone on every single plane. Everyone on all those planes are all That's hostages. True. It's true. Technically. Yeah. Oh, in Die Hard 3, are they holding the city of New York hostage, Ty? <laughs> yeah, well, they're holding, a, they're holding a school full of children hostage. This show's got to be over, right? And yes, they are holding the city of New York hostage. Yes, that's true. I think, I, I think we lost Clint. 
<laughs> so in uh we've lost Clint halfway through the first episode. <laughs> so uh in in uh Fortress, uh Rachel Ward is a is a school teacher and they're out in the outskirts, out in the outback in the middle of nowhere, and uh these four burly guys with Christmas mask on, I think it was Christmas mask. They come in with shotguns and they kidnap her and these kids and they want to hold them for ransom. What what I love about it is when they first capture her, you're like, you know, you just, your heart goes out to them, but then they form together and work together as a team and they end up defeating these uh, scary, scary guys that have taken them. And it's, it's yeah. a really great, I think it would be a great remake. Ty, should we, should we uh, look into that and remake that? I, I, I hate remakes. Just let good movies be good movies. We don't have to remake oh, I, all of them. I, 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 yeah, I agree. Also, also, <laughs> who today is Rachel Ward? I mean, Rachel Ward was something she special. Was. Is something special, but yeah. I'm not going to argue with you on, on Fortress. I think Fortress Excellent. is a great movie. So we got our top five. Die Hard, Fuck You, Clint, Dog Day Afternoon, Man on Fire, <laughs> Ruthless People, and uh, Fortress. You know what? And I like what I like about that is you get a nice mix of things. You got some comedy, got some action movie. Yeah, yeah. Well, this has been so much fun. It's so good to see you. And uh, this has been so good to uh, see you too. Yeah, and uh, thank you for coming on. Thank you for inviting me. It's uh, it's an honor to be to be included in the tie in that guy legacy. So, and I love that you guys. Well, love we're going to try to get more crew on. Well, we're gonna we're gonna wrap this up. Bye. So we're gonna kick Lindsay out of Lindsay, here. Lindsay, get out of here. You, you were funny, thank and you. we appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, say goodbye, Ty. Goodbye, Ty.